All right, Sam and I are at Winco. We're doing Winco. And there's chickens everywhere. This is where we used to live. And we're doing Winco. And there's chickens. Not so many right now. It's kind of hot, so they're probably roosting. Winco, our favorite store. All right, we're here and we got our pantry stock. We got our bags. I got my little helper here and our cash envelope and we're gonna go for it.
Okay, so I have been all over the store and finally the butcher helped me find the vegan Beyond Meat. We're done. It's quite a lot. There's a lot of, I got a lot of flats of canned things. There's only certain canned things I actually like. And I got a lot of stuff. I spent, I think, three seventy six. dollars So my budget was 400 and I spent three seventy six, and I bought everything. And I even bought Sam a little present. And uh, I think we're going to hit Taco Bell because we are starving. I'm having a vegetarian crunch wrap. I love the vegetarian crunch wraps. And we love this Taco Bell over here because they have tons of trees. And you drive through the trees and their food is always it's super clean in there. The food is always hot and fresh for fast food. But we have our ice water and we packed our snacks so we don't need any extras. Also, I was teaching Sam, you always take the napkins. You save all the napkins and put them in your glove compartment for emergencies. And if they ask you if you want sauce, you always say yes and lots of it. And you save it and I put it in a jar in the kitchen to use later because I love Taco Bell sauce. Okay, I we just got home and I got a bake and it's hot. It's hotter than Hades, but I have to bake it. I wanted to do it this morning, but then I got all crazy and decided to go to Winco. So anyway, we're gonna throw these in the oven. I'm gonna show you what I got for $3.76. Well. I, after I talked to you last and showed you what I purchased at Winco, I spent the whole afternoon outside swimming and sitting outside in my bathing suit, doing my little chakra card spreads and writing and had a nice long chat with a friend of mine, Oregon, you all know her, Oregon. And, um, and now I feel just wonderful, just fellow. I have so much stuff to share with you, but I'm kind of, I'm boiling my date syrup again. I've got, okay, what I got going, I did the two loaves of sourdough, they're in the oven, they're done. They were done hours ago. But I'm doing my date. I'm going to boil it up again. And then I think I'm just going to blend it. I think I'm just going to blend it. I know. I know that I'm supposed to. Because I thought it was a lot easier than it was. But you're supposed to boil it up. Let it sit. And then strain it through a cheesecloth. And then boil the syrup. And then you can use the rest of it as paste. I don't have any need for paste. And I don't want, that's like, it's too much work for me. So I'm going to boil it up one more time to really soften it and break it down. And then I think I'm just going to blend it. I mean, I actually don't care if I, um, well, I better not say that. I was going to say, I don't really care if I have, you know, kind of um, little chunks of dates in my coffee, but I might not mean that. I might have some tomorrow and be like, oh. But I'm gonna blend it and use it in my coffee because I'm just getting, you know, more, more and more holistic. And, you know, just not. I was debating, I was gonna buy just, I was gonna just have my flour and and make my pasta by hand. I'm not quite ready for that. Uh, I'm not quite ready, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. There's some things going on. I'm making my own syrup. I've decided not to buy any more bread. I don't even know next year when the kids go back to school, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna buy bread anymore. I'm just trying to do everything, make everything from scratch. And, you know, no matter how you slice it, dice it, and cut it, and put it back together, if you have a tiny grocery budget, or you're on food stamps, the only way you can make everything stretch till the end of the month 
is to find a super inexpensive store like mine is Winco and Grocery Outlet. And now I have an Asian store. That store was so affordable and an Indian store. What's going on here? Oh. Oh. Where's my water? You lay down. You're fine. You just had dinner. Um, lots of ice water. It's hot out. So I have found a few stores. I have four stores now that I love that are just really nice, clean, cheap stores. And I I have tried everything. I mean, I have gone to every store you can imagine, except for like Aldi's and Kroger, because we don't have them around us. But I've tried everything, Dollar General, everything. These are the stores that are the cheapest for me. And I do 90, 80, no, 90% of my shopping is grocery outlet. And then I, you know, I buy bulk flowers, organic flowers and such at the health food store. And then I take a trip to Winco every three to six months. I go and I really, that's why I go shop. And I mean, I shop. But I spent about five fifty between the Indian store, the Asian store, Winco, and Winco. I've spent... $550, but I'm pretty well stocked. And the more I cook from scratch, the more I move away from, you know, we're not doing the ultra processed or even the heavily processed. I did buy some Beyond Meat. Now the Beyond Meat is a processed vegan meat. And what else? Oh, and pasta I bought box pasta and I bought some spaghetti sauce. However, I use those sparingly. I use them very sparingly, but the more I just stick with like stay in the bulk section and the produce section and I stay as plant-based and as whole food as possible and the more I make everything from scratch so all I need are basic ingredients grains legumes flour produce seasoning oil the cheaper my grocery bill is it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller so all the stuff I purchased will last quite a long time and our garden is starting to produce. We're getting some green beans, some bell peppers, some greens. The tomatoes are getting big. I gotta get in there and prune my tomatoes. Prune the plants down a little bit. I think they're really happy because everybody says, you know, tomatoes like tons of sun and heat, but then I've had people tell me that tomatoes don't actually like to be too hot and too much in the sun. So it's working out perfectly because the sunflowers are shading them a little bit. But I gotta get it in there and prune. So I'm just working on mastering the gardening, you know, just becoming a master gardener. And, um, and I'm really working on the frugal thing. I learned all these tools and I've used them on and off throughout the years. But for some reason, I feel really, well, I mean, first of all, it's a necessity. Oh, hold on. Okay, my date syrup is boiled. My hummingbird stuff is boiled. Now we gotta let it cool. Um, for number one, it's a necessity. You know, if we wanna live comfortably and I want to make sure that I stay home and I remain in the home and secure that position because I don't want to work out there. There's nothing wrong with working out there. I had a good time when I worked out there in the wild world. 
I had some great jobs. I had a good time. I made a lot of friends. I had a great social life. I have no desire to do it anymore. I don't want to go out there and work anymore. And I don't know that I'd have the energy or the patience to do it anymore. And I am crazy about my home and my, our garden, our home, our garden. I'm crazy about being with my kids. Like my biggest thing is I do not want to be separated from my kids at all. You know, they have their school and they have their social stuff and that's going to grow and grow. You know, and they have the library and those things are going to grow over time. But my kids and I are pretty bonded and attached. And, you know, we all, you know, as they're getting older, I kind of have my own thing too. But my thing that I love that keeps me fulfilled is I love playing with my house because it's just my big grown up dollhouse. I love working in my garden. It's very therapeutic. And, you know, like in the evenings when I go out and I water and I watch the birds and I have a lot of bluebirds in my yard and they live in my yard now. They full on live in my yard. I don't know if they go south in the winter. I, I don't know, but they are living with me this summer and I feel like they're my pets. I do. I feel like I have these pets and they're not afraid of me anymore. They're not afraid of any of us. They're busy. They're doing their thing. They're living their little bluebird life. And they're in my garden all the time eating the bugs. I watch them. I'm just like, oh, I'm so grateful because I don't have chickens to go in there. Although chickens are dangerous. People sometimes show like, oh, I let my chickens out in my garden, you know, in the morning. It's like, well, I had chickens before. I had chickens growing up and I had chickens for a while at the blue house. Those chickens will destroy and eat down a garden and demolish it within a day. So I don't know what that's about. Maybe they have mastered their chicken whispers or whatever. I don't know. But the birds are perfect because the birds don't touch any of my produce because I got food in there. I got a water bath. You know, I got a bird bath in there. And they just, you know, so they get in there and they just eat the bugs. And there's tons of bugs. So they devour the bugs and they get the bugs out of the compost and they get the bugs out of the garden and then they do their own thing. And so I water in the evenings, you know, I listen to the sounds and I watch my little pet bluebirds and I water and I'm really trying to be present right now. I'm feel, I'm feeling muddled lately that's the word muddled just really like um a brain fatigue a brain fatigue i don't know how else to describe it and i realized you know the other day i was out in the garden i started watering all the fruit trees and i was gonna stop and go get my phone and my earphones and listen to, you know, maybe a long video or a live stream. And I thought, or music. And I thought, no, no. From the time I get up in the morning, and this is what I've become aware of, from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed, I am always reading something, listening to something, watching something or sometimes all three i got the music going and i'm reading or i'm reading and i'm watching a movie or i got a movie on the background while i'm writing there's always something that i'm taking in taking in and a lot of times it's educational i'm reading something and i'm studying it and it's educational or I'm listening to something, you know, YouTube, but I, I like the ones that teach me. I like to watch videos that teach me something. Which that's all great and dandy. But I never take a break. I don't 
take an evening off or a weekend off or a holiday off or a summer off. It's constantly ingesting information and it never stops. There's no peace. And I've been feeling um, this muddled, brain foggy, kind of confused. Um, I, I don't know, brain exhaustion, information overload. And I realized you never, I'm talking to myself, you, Kate, never take the time to just be quiet and process it. And I was doing that a while back, but I have done it for a long time. I'm just busy, busy taking it in, taking it in, or I'm filming or I'm writing or I'm... So I was reading Connie's work. I've had to get through, I have a lot of her old entries. I've gotten a lot of answers for us too, because I know some of us, with Connie Hullquist, we were like, how? How did she buy a house? How did she make it with all these kids and no money? How did she? So I have read through all the old email postings, writings that she did. I don't think it's all of them. It's some of them, but not all of them. So I had 720 pages, but it turns out, it turns out that a lot of the writings were repeated like anywhere from two to five times. So I had to clear out those. And then she has some writings that are just too much for me. I don't mind her religious stuff. That's her, that's her thing, that's her jive. And I actually read some of them and I find I translate it into a spiritual message for me. I don't, I don't have the same belief systems um, I don't know how to explain it because I don't want to offend anyone because I don't have any problems, but I, I'm not a Christian and I'm not religious. How's that? But I am spiritual and I love all the messages, be it from Jesus or Buddha or Paramahansa Gyokananda or, you know, I love them all. And, and... I do love the messages and the workings of Jesus. I do. And so I kind of take her rant. At first, I was like, I cannot handle these religious rants because she feels like she is ministering to the women and trying to lead them to Jesus and bring them home. But it's too much. It's like I hear what I understand what she's trying to do. This is Connie Hulquist I'm talking about. I get what she's trying to do. All right, but it's it's too much. It's like take it down about five levels and let people, you know, like do it gently. Because a lot of times when things are shoved down your throat, like even veganism, spirituality, veganism, anything, you know, the carnivore diet, because people are really, some people are into that anything, politics, whatever, if it's shoved down your throat, you wind up hating it and turning on it. So, um, but also she's got a lot of belief systems that I cannot jive with. I do not agree with wholeheartedly. And there's some other stuff that actually is offensive to me, you know, but you know what? I'm like, okay, but she also has some wisdom. She does have some wisdom in there. And if you can get through all that, and maybe you don't need to, but as I've gotten through all that, I deleted a lot of the things that offended me or made me like I actually was angry and had to work through them. I deleted all that so that I could just focus on, she's got some wise stuff. And, and some of her religious talk, no, Molly, hold on. So with that said, I cleared out the stuff that I couldn't handle and now I can hear her. And um, I really love the stories about homemaking 
and her cooking and her gardening and her medicines and how she grows all these herbs and makes medicines and teas. And she's very funny sometimes. She really is. She's got some, some writings that, you know, I was like, you're actually a funny gal. And she does. Like sometimes when she does talk about some things like big churches and government, she's kind of got them pegged, the corruption and, you know, taking advantage of the poor and I'd have to agree with her on some stuff, but not all of it. But she talks a lot about her friend Dixie, who was married to a truck driver and adopted a girl, Emily, when she was, she adopted, Emily was six months old when Dixie adopted her. And I don't know if they lived out in the country or what. At one point, she said she lived in an apartment or, I don't know, she rented um, a place maybe out in the country and she had an enormous garden. She had an apple tree and a huge, huge garden. And Dixie loved to garden. She loved to can. She loved to home make. She loved to... You know, when the tough, when things got hard, she, it, it, she actually thrived. Like when there were like hard times, she thrived. And she'd sit down and plan an even bigger garden next year. And she'd can like up to 800 quarts a year. I mean, amazing. And Dixie, I guess, went through a little depression. I haven't read all the writings and I've skimmed through a lot of them, but... What I get is Dixie went through a depression and she was really seeking spiritual peace and wisdom. And so at some point she just went, she focused on home. She had, I guess she had a really wild life. Maybe her youth was really crazy and wild and she just didn't want to be a part of the world anymore at all. She did not want to be a part of it. And so she focused on being home with her, her husband was a truck driver, so he's gone a lot, but she had Emily, her daughter, and she focused on her homemaking and her gardening and her little girl and, you know, making things happen, canning like crazy and, and taking care of things. And she thrived on, like I said, she thrived on being a little poor and hard time. She, it oh, just made her thrive. She loved it. And she went through this kind of weird time and she went home and she focused on being home. And she got, she didn't have anything. She didn't have a phone. She didn't have a TV. She had a radio she'd listen to in the evenings. She got rid of all of it or she didn't have any of it. And she just got into her spiritual work. And she would always say, and Connie was kind of jealous because Connie said, I have tried to find wisdom or tried to get wisdom for 21 years and here Dixie gets it in two weeks. But Dixie also got rid of everything, the TV, the phone, everything to focus. And that is a very spiritual thing, whether you're Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, it's a very Zen thing to, um, you know, to get rid of the outside world, to go off into the proverbial wilderness or like the monks go off into the mountains and they don't have the outside world influencing them or bothering them or getting them all worked up and they don't have the TV and they don't have the phones and the this and the computers. And so that they can focus on their spiritual work, which is a quiet inward work. And that way we hear spirit, we hear God, we connect. We're always connected, but we hear, we finally hear because it's very quiet, It's very quiet. We have to really be quiet here. And so you gotta get rid of the outside stuff, noise, distractions, and that really resonated with me. And I was thinking about how I'm noticing how muddled and kind of confused and like, I'll do something. And then I'm like, when did I do that? And I'm totally acting like my mother now. 
I have three times now I've been like, where are my glasses? And they're on my head. Yesterday we were shopping and I was panicking because I couldn't find my wallet. It was under my arm. So feeling, you know, just having moments lost. Like, when did I do that? How did I get here? You know, not like really. I don't have Alzheimer's or dementia in my family. And it is not that. It is just too much, too much information, too many distractions, too much noise, overload, overload, overload. So I read that. And see, this is why I keep re reading Connie's work. I, you know, boy, I wrestle with that woman. I wrestle with that woman in my mind, argue with her. But... I keep coming back, keep coming back to her because when she talks about Dixie, when she tells her life stories, when she talks about her friend Jill, even though I only get little pieces, they are, and they seem kind of humble and, you know, not a big deal. Like she's just kind of talking and telling a little story about Dixie or Jill or herself. It helps me so much and it causes great change. It's like, I'm at that place where I, I stayed up to 1.30 last night reading her stuff. And then I felt like I wanted to write like crazy. And I did, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And I got this morning and I had very strong coffee. I learned this from a friend of mine. I made a, my coffee and then I threw in a scoop of instant coffee to give it a little extra kick because I'm just trying to have one cup of coffee a day and I just usually normally have a normal cup of coffee. But today I was tired because I was up. I couldn't go to sleep. I wanted to read this these things and I wanted to write and think. And um, the thing about Dixie, I was like, that's what's happening. I need to, I, I'm gonna, I wanna continue to film I don't feel like this is intruding. I actually feel like this is a way for me to express my journey. And and I really hope that it serves all of you. But I'm, I wanna continue to film and I wanna continue to write, but I'm gonna just focus like, instead of reading, like I took all my books, I took all my books back to the library and I'm not ordering any more books. I do have some movies but I find that I don't even have the attention span for those. I got all these movies. I've watched 10 minutes of this movie, half an hour of that movie, and I'm like, I'm not into it. So the kids, the kids can hang out in my office and watch movies and they love to. I think Sam's in there watching Zombie Land right now. Um, but I'm not into it. The TV's gone. I don't get online. I do, like I do for 10 minutes, I get online to check my bank, my Yahoo, I mean my email. And I love to reply to your comments. I love your comments. I love um, interacting. I do, I actually look forward to your comments. I'm kind of bummed because sometimes there aren't many comments. And I like comments where there's a little story or um, you share an experience or you share your feelings. That's what I really thrive off of. I feed off of. Those things are not, but like 10 minutes online to just do a little bit of administrative. And, and that's it. Like I'm not even watching YouTube right now. I love YouTube, but I'm not watching it. I don't have the TV. I'm kind of like done. And I felt like Dixie, like Dixie had this wild life and she didn't want to go out in the world. And she didn't want to go to the store. She hated it. So she would can and she'd grow all this food and can all this food and cook from scratch just so you, she wouldn't have to go to town or go to the store. And I kind of get it. I'm not going to be like that. I cannot be as amazing as Dixie. But um, like today, going into town, <laughs> I was white knuckling it on the steering wheel, I was just like, oh. And then when I went in the store, like I kind of looked around me and sometimes I look around me and the people I see, you know, most of the time I really enjoy other people. 
but sometimes I look around and I'm a little bit tripped out by the people around me. Like I can feel their energy and they're, you know, not happy or they're, I don't know, on something. Like sometimes I can tell when people are on things like pills, like maybe they take sleeping pills or pills to calm down or or they're just not happy or they're stressed or they're angry or they're, and I look around sometimes and I get a little freaked out. I feel like I'm in like one of those scary houses at the carnival. And then I had to remind myself when I went in there and I was kind of in judgment, I was looking around and I was already like in awful traffic and I the town just kind of looked run down and dusty and everything was hot and I was just, I was kind of going through my trip. And then I thought, you know what? I looked at everyone around me and I thought, these are just spirits, just like me. We are just little spirits stuffed into these awkward human bodies here just trying to figure it out. Figure it out until we, you know, get to go home. And the minute I thought like that, I felt like this adoration, like this kind of like, I looked at people differently, like all of a sudden I cared about them again. And I felt this, you know, endearment to them again, this connection, you know, because we are all connected. We really are. And then my energy changed and then I was enjoying, people were very kind and respectful and, there was that connection again. You know, people would kind of overhear me talking to Sam and they would get in on the conversation. I had this one old lady. Oh, she's just as cute as could be. She had this wig on and it was kind of crooked and she's just adorable. And she was in back and I was trying to load up because what happens is I fill up my cart and then I try to get it on the, you know, the runner as fast as possible and pay for it and then pack it up and get out of everyone's way as fast as possible. Because at Winco, you bag your own stuff. And it feels like those grocery store challenges where they're like, how fast can she unload her groceries? Pay for them and load them back up into the cart and get out of the way. And, you know, there's this nervousness because, you know, people are lining up behind you. And I was loading all my stuff onto the runner. And then I had, you know, I was like, I hope I have enough money. Cause that's scary too. Cause I only had this, you know, envelope. I'm like, if I don't have enough money, I'm in trouble. And I did tell the checker, I said, you know, like 400's my limit. And he was very kind. He said, I think you're gonna make it. And I did, I made it, I was able to get everything. And then when I was paying for it and the lady was watching me the whole time, which was making me kind of nervous too. But she was watching what I was loading on there and then she heard the total and she said, <laughs> she said, you did real good. And I was like, thank you. Cause it was kind of like a grandma giving you some kudos. I'm like, thank you. Because <laughs> it's a little bit of a challenge cause I didn't bring my calculator. I wasn't even rounding things up in my head. I was just praying but it was all gonna work out in the end and it did. But um, I felt like that, like when I got home, I thought I wanna really stock my cupboards and my pantry. I have shelving unit in the bedroom, in the closet, and I wanna stock that up. I wanna stock everything up. I wanna get so stocked up that I rarely, rarely have to go to the store. I really do, and I don't want to, I told Bali, if I go to Winco, the next time I go to Winco, you have to drive me. I can't, if Bali's with me, I don't worry, because he drives, I read a book, and then he pushes the cart, and I don't know, I didn't realize he kept things grounded, because sometimes he can, sometimes him and the kids can be an added like the grocery game, you know, the grocery challenge, like let's throw in a few distractions 
and see if she can focus. You know, and so sometimes the husband and the kids is like, mm. but sometimes, especially if it's just me and Bali, it keeps me calm and grounded. He does the driving, he pushes the cart, he keeps me focused and, um, you know, make sure I don't, you know, throw weird things in the cart. <sighs> but out there on my own in the wild, I was like, I can't do it. Anyway. <laughs> I felt like Dixie and I felt like, I feel like it's time. I don't know. Maybe it's things going on in the world. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's, you know, cause we're getting close to election time. I don't know. And let's not talk about politics on here, but there's things going on in the world. And I feel like I take it in. I can feel it. I absorb it. And there are times when I go outside the house and I go into town and I feel like, I'm going to turn around and go right back home. Like, I just feel like it is not, it doesn't feel good out here. It doesn't feel safe and nothing's really happening. It's just me taking on all this stuff, the energies. And I will literally do whatever I have to quickly turn around and get home. And I will not feel that. And I know I've talked about this before. I, and then it's like, I will not feel safe till I turn on my street. And then it's like, okay, I'm okay. I'm on the street now, I'm okay. And then I'm home. And I'm kind of feeling like that. Like I just need to be home. And I'm enjoying the writings because there is such a safety and um, a spiritual, comfort and uh, emotional safety in just being home. Like make your home into a sanctuary, make your yard into a sanctuary and make it a place where everybody feels safe. And, you know, and it's not always peaceful in my home. Oh my goodness, I've got a tween and then I got a crazy 10 year old boy. And then my husband and I are both like, oh, loud, passionate people. My whole, this whole, we're crazy here. We're passionate, we're loud. You know, we're laughing and arguing and, you know, but safe, like emotionally, we know we're safe. We're in a loving, safe zone and we can be sheltered from the outside world. Whatever goes on out there, we know we can come home and we've got this delightful, cozy home and we've got good food on the stove or a good coffee, you know, and we've got people surrounding us that listen and care and will nurture us and support us and protect us and, you know, back us. And that's what we all need and deserve in our lives. And even if you are single and you just have a little dog or a little cat, you can still, that's your sanctuary. You make it your sanctuary and you're gonna have a heck of a lot more peace than those of us who have, you know, families because you gotta deal with all their stuff, you know? But reading that's that, um, you know, Connie's very pro being at home and that there are spiritual, places at home and and tending to our families and I don't I don't think that that is for everyone but for me it is for me I love being home but I have a lot of things I have my writing and I have my filming and I'm also um focused lately I feel very focused on the home I like to read about the home I like to learn about the home. I love to go through my cookbooks, thumb through them. I love to write out pantry lists and plan how I'm gonna really stock up my pantries. And I love to learn about my gardening and go out and water every evening and harvest things and see how well things are growing after three years of hard work we finally have a lush garden and there's still weird things happening. My nectarines have split. They're not even ready yet and they've split open. I don't know why. 
And my corn, like it looks like there's some little tiny skinny undeveloped ears of corn with the silk already. So there's weird things going on. But every year, but I take it with stride now because every year there's something. And, and, and I've lost a couple trees. <sighs> it's just every year. I lose a tree or two. I get a bug infestation. I get borers or leaf curl or who knows. But I learn and learn and learn and learn. And now I'm like getting pretty good at keeping everything alive and going and lush and and my soil is alive and and I have so many bugs and and I don't like it but at the same time I do like it because it means my soil and my yard's alive there was a time when there was nothing out in my yard hardly any birds hardly any bugs hardly any bees nothing gravel some overgrown trees couple overgrown fruit trees that were producing and the soil was probably poisoned. I think that whoever lived here did a lot of car work out there. You know, they did all their car work and we're still cleaning up glass, you know, from the garden. Every time we turn it over and dig it up, there's glass. So lots of parties and lots of automotive care was going on out there. But with the sunflowers and the mending and the cleaning it up, you know, things, the soil's just getting rich. And my yard is loaded with bugs and bees and dragonflies and birds and skunks and a fox and squirrels. Now, I don't have any ground squirrels, and I'm sorry for those of you who do. I have tree squirrels. They don't give a hoot about my garden. So that's why I can love them, because they don't pester me. And there's lots of nut trees around here. So they're they're like well-fed, happy, mind their business. But um, I am feeling more and more that I just want to dive deeper into my home. And I want to write about it. And I want to talk about it. And I want to film it. And, you know... Who knows if I'll ever write fiction. I had this big fantasy dream of being a fictional writer and I was going to give up YouTube and, and go off into the wilderness and write fiction under a pen name. I may do that at some point, you know, not go off into the wilderness or quit YouTube because I tried that and it didn't work. But I may, you know, I've got a pen name figured out. I've got a pen name I love and I've started a million books, but it's just not right right now. It's not where I'm at and I'm honoring that, you know, and so, and I'm really into the frugal. I'm really, and I don't know if the hard times are coming because I'm reading Connie stuff and she's just like, hard times are coming, hard times are coming. Well, that was the 80s and um hard times did come but not till 2008 i mean there's always the economy goes up and down and up and down it's just the con it's just normal life and hard times did come but that was in 2008 and then they recovered and now we have some craziness yeah. um i've had people I have watched a few shows and they have suggested that we're kind of in that um, his phase of history, the Roaring Twenties, you know, where everything, people are living high on the hog and living wild and partying and, and then the depression came. But Connie talked about this too in the 80s. Well, then it was the 2000s. Oh, actually, maybe her writings were in the 2000s. Never mind. Her writings were in the 2000s. So she actually was right. She said hard times are coming. And, and yeah, 2008, because a lot of her writings are like 2006, around those years. So she was right. Hard times did come for a lot of people. Um, but then she talked about you know, the roaring 20s and and how it was kind of looking like that. 
and then the depression and that is true because to that things were people were living high off the hog and there was all kinds of construction going on and i remember we lived in um well i didn't live in that area but they were doing a lot of the mcmansions in sacramento area i remember that but <clears throat> they were doing all these big mansions they called them Suburbias with the huge houses. And then all of a sudden, they had all these neighborhoods. They had all these. And I remember visiting a friend in Sacramento. And we were driving through the country. And they had all these suburban, suburban neighborhoods with the McMansions. And they were empty. There would be like one house that had people living in it. And then they were surrounded by a ghost town, a ghost neighborhood. It's weird. And now there seems to be a housing shortage. I'm like, how did we, in such a short amount of time, we had empty McMansions everywhere and empty suburbias, and now we have a housing shortage. But now, um, so yeah, she was kind of right. It was everybody, we were building like crazy in McMansions and People were living high off the hog and then everything crashed. And people were buying houses they couldn't afford and doing adjustable loans, so man. But now, you know, they talk about how, oh, banks are real careful now and they're, you know, there's really a lot of um, steps and procedures and security and to make sure this doesn't happen again and lots of caution and, I don't know, because I see that, you know, the houses now and the rents are out of control, out of control. We are surrounded on either side of us. Every house on either side of us is four to 600,000. And we bought our house for 250. We were lucky. We were lucky. So, and then the rents, you know, the average rent in California is 28.96 or 94. It's like what? It's like pretty much almost $3,000. And that's just wild. I mean, when we were renting just not long ago, what, seven years ago we were renting, we paid $1,000 for a little house. And then before that we paid, you know, um, 1300 for a big ranch house out in the country on a fruit farm. And we always paid about 12, 1300. So that's just, you know, and, and there's, you know, a housing shortage and, you know, so stuff's going on that's not right. And I'm no expert, so I'm not gonna talk out about it. I'm just gonna say it's not right. I mean, I'm just a simple gal, but I'm, I can see that it's not right. And people are living way, way, way above their means. And I see people with super expensive houses, you know, that they purchased and and driving new cars. Because, well, I want to, you know, I use this car for commuting, so I got to have a new car that, because I hear that a lot. Well, I got this new car because... And they're almost just, I never ask, I don't care, it's not my business, but people justify it. They'll, they're uncomfortable with their decisions. And they'll say, well, I had to get this new car because I have to make sure, I mean, I commute and I gotta make sure I got have something that doesn't break down and, you know, and I don't say anything, but we have two old paint peeling, dented up, windshield crack cars that are like, 300,000 miles and I don't, I refuse to get a new car. Bali's always tempted. Sometimes I get tempted too. I have to admit, sometimes I get tempted too, but, but then I get my sanity and I'm like, if the car runs, you know, it's like, I would rather have those cars till they just do not run anymore, you know? And, and we also do not have big commutes. We have, Bali has a three mile commute and I don't have a commute. It's ever when school time starts. And then I have a, like a five, six mile commute. That's it. So, 
you know, um, you choose your lifestyle and you choose your, the way, you know, you make your choices. So I do look around and I just wonder when's the bottom going to fall out? When's it all, you know, and, and they keep talking about a big recession. Then they say, Oh, it passed. Don't worry. It, it passed. We're okay. Or, oh, it's, it might be here, but you know what? It's not going to be that, you know, it's just kind of just a little ripple in the way, you know, ripple in the water. But you might want to get prepared. It's like, well, which is it? A ripple in the water? Or we, we need to get prepared, you know? But you can't count on it. The government has an agenda. Financial channels, channels and, and, news programs and stuff that are all about finances, they have an agenda. And sometimes they don't want people to know how bad it is because it would cause mass hysteria. And I can understand that you do not want mass hysteria. We saw that when the quarantine, people are going cuckoo, buying all the water, all the pinto beans. Buy, you, you go to a nursery, you cannot buy a plant or a seed or a tree. You get online, sold out. I was trying to get trees and stuff online, sold out, sold out, sold out. We luckily, the minute the quarantine happened and they shut things down, I literally that week ran over to Green Acres and I filled my truck with fruit trees and nut trees and berry vines and bought as many seeds and I bought everything. And everything that I thought we would need. But see, we were going to do it anyway. I wasn't going to, you know, I mean, if you're in a quarantine, like it takes years for your fruit trees and nut trees to actually produce. And it takes years to amend your soil. So it's not going to happen overnight. But um, we were going to do this anyway. But I wanted to hurry up before they shut down the nurseries. Or everything got sold out. I'm like, I wanted to start my farm right away. You know? Okay, Mariah's in here. She says she doesn't care if I record with her. Uh, and I'm going to wrap it up, but um, I forgot where I was at, but it's okay. Anyway, yeah, I just wonder sometimes, you know, I don't really listen. Everyone has an agenda or a reason why they're not. Either they think they're telling the truth or they're not for a reason but I look around and I think nobody can afford this life anymore. They can't. So I do think that something's going to happen. And I think that it has to happen. It needs to happen. It'll probably not be very fun at first, but it will lead to wonderful things. Because I think if we could all learn to just kind of live a little more humbly, smaller, simpler, cheaper, it would be really good for us and for our mental health and it would be good for the planet and it would be good for communities and you know it just be good all the way around you know and i just know we live really humbly simply cheaply and sometimes, and actually it doesn't even look like it. Like if you look at my house, my house is so bright and colorful and cheerful. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't look like we live humbly, but we do. You've, you've seen, you've been in my car. You've seen my crack windshield. You know, we live simply. And the unidentifiable, uh, unidentifiable crumbs everywhere. The unidentifiable what? Unidentifiable crumbs are everywhere crumbs unidentified well there's even more now because sam and i ate in the car today uh, sam yeah. ate cookies in the car so there's crumbs everywhere uh, you see also for those of you wondering you know i know with connie connie raised a big family on nothing and I mean nothing. I don't even know how she, I still don't know. I read through all her stuff. I'm like, how did you do it? Stop preaching and tell us how you did it. But I did find out how she got her house, kind of. So the big question was how she was, she was married to Jim, but Jim was always, you know, for 12 years, 12, 13 years, he was in and out of prison. 
and she was on her own with three kids. And she was on all the government assistance, welfare, food stamps, medic, I mean everything, government assistance. And I glean this out, out of all the things, her books, her, you know, email writings, everything. I gleaned a, a little bit of everything. But <clears throat> at one point she bought a house and I think it was $12,000. She bought a house for $12,000 and I thought, how? How did she, because back in the 70s, you still, a woman still had to have a husband's permission or a father's permission to get a loan, to purchase anything. And she was on government assistance and Jim was a convict. So I'm like, how did she do it? But. She never really went into that, but she said in one of her little writings, she said that she was pregnant with her third child and she decided that she wanted to buy a house because she had been struggling and she was on welfare. And when she had her first son, there was a time when they were so poor, they got kicked out of one of their houses around Christmas time. And they almost wound up on the street, but the church helped them get another place. And so she was tired of the instability and she decided the smartest thing to do was to own your house. So she decided that the smart thing, you know, she was on her third baby and her husband, Jim came around, he was there and she, well, she decided she needed to buy a house. So Jim finally showed back up and she was on welfare getting $150 a month. This was in the seventies and she bought a house for $12,000. She put 150 down and the mortgage with taxes insurance was 135 a month. So I still don't know how she got a loan, but the house was in really bad shape and it was falling down and so maybe that's why she got it because it was in really bad shape and it was falling down and $12,000. So that's all she said. She said Jim was there. She was seven months pregnant. She had decided she had to have, she wanted to own her own home and she put 150 down of her welfare money. And then she, every month she had to pay 135 and how she, I mean, Obviously food stamps pay for her food, you know, and she probably had cloth diapers cause she talks about having cloth diapers, you know, and those in the seventies and stuff, they, we didn't, I don't think disposables were a big thing. People were doing cloth diapers in the seventies. But um, you think about it, her mortgage and everything was 135. That leaves $15 for her gas and her electric and her water. And I don't even know if she had garbage. Yeah, cause she probably could, she probably didn't make much garbage, but she at least had a yard. She could now grow food and she had a shelter and it was filled with bugs and she got rid of them with, I think, boric acid. And, and then Jim disappeared. Jim was there long enough to get her this house cause he probably had to sign for it and help her move and she said they lived they were like 10 blocks away and they had to move everything on foot and there she was seven months pregnant with two kids and they moved all her stuff by hand on foot and then he disappeared and she wound up having her baby alone and bringing her child home alone i don't know i don't know who helped her back then I don't know how she put up with Jim so long, but he did make it up to her. He did. He came, he, he, after 12 years, he did finally show up and he stayed and he never left again. And he worked, he constantly worked and he constantly brought home money, but not a lot. And then she talks about how she had three more children. He wanted to have three more children and she was afraid, but then she thought she'd have faith. Well, good thing it turned out well, because they had three more children. And um, she decided she wanted to homeschool all her kids. 
and it was against the law in Iowa. So they took away her food stamps and her probably her medical, her medical and her food stamps. And Jim could only give her 200 a month. But I mean, that was the 80s, and I know food prices in the 80s compared to now were very different, but still, she was feeding seven to eight people every day off $50 a week. But she figured that out too. She said they had a huge garden in the front yard, and the backyard, and the side yard, and she canned a lot, but it, she could not grow enough to feed them all. And she bought a lot, she'd go to the stores and buy the old produce that they were gonna throw out for a dollar or two each crate and bring home all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was, it was too bad, it went in the compost, but she learned how to work with all of it and figure it out. But she'd buy tons, she'd buy huge bags of flour and she'd buy huge bags of potatoes. And, you know, and then, Every night, it sounds like they had beef all the time, but they'd have cheap ground beef, and she always used a pound. No matter how many people were there or what she was making, it was always a pound, only a pound. And then everything else was like, she'd make, she'd gro do ground beef and make a big vegetable soup, or she'd make, you know, what she calls Salisbury steaks, or she'd make gravy, she'd make beef gravy and potatoes, everything. Potatoes in the soup, mashed potatoes and gravy, potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. Which, she talks about how Jim had to have potatoes with everything. I wish that my family was like that. I, Bali does not, he puts potatoes in all his, like all his soups have potatoes in them. But that's the only way he'll do potatoes. Other than that, he is not interested. He does not like mashed potatoes. I could live off mashed potatoes and gravy every day. I'm not kidding. I love mashed potatoes and gravy. I love down home country comfort food. I really do. But that's, so that's how they ate, you know? And then what else? And then she talks about her friend Jill all the time. And Jill's husband left her with some kids and she was on welfare too. And she talks about how Jill could grow crazy, perfect, big, beautiful gardens and can like crazy. I mean, this is what I respect about these women. Like they were poor and they were on welfare and government assistance, but they never talked about the food bank. I never heard one word about the food bank and I don't really get why because even the depression era books, they talk about kind of like these food, sort of like a food bank, like their stories kids would tell about how their dad, you know, they would go with their dad, they'd have to walk to this place and they get free onions and potatoes and this and that. So they're always like food distribution places. And I'm sure in the 70s and the 80s, and this was in the 80s when she decided to homeschool and but I'm sure they had food banks then. And back then it was big old government, you know, cheese and this and that. And she doesn't actually, I'm, I haven't read of it in, in these things that I'm reading, but I know in her Kitchen Saints book, she talks about, I think Jill may be married again. Um, I'm, I just get, I, someone said that she used to have like thousands and thousands of writings and they were all, deleted. So there's a lot of loopholes we don't know. But maybe Jill got married again, or I don't know. But I remember her mentioning either Dixie or Jill, her husband laughing about the government cheese. So maybe she did do the food bank and she just doesn't mention it. But um, I don't know. Or maybe because she was homeschooled and she wasn't even allowed to do that, which would be cruel. That would be really cruel. But I think Jill's husband used to laugh about the government cheese. Or maybe I'm reading something else. See, I read too much stuff. I can never... 
anyway, but what, what I do respect about them, you know, here they are, they are having kids, they're on government assistance, okay. But a lot of them wound up in that situation, like Jill had a husband, but he took off. Connie had a husband, but he took off. But they didn't sit around whining. They made it work. Connie somehow wound up buying a house with her welfare checks, even though she barely had enough to make it. And they all grew huge gardens. Dixie, Jill, Connie, especially, especially Dixie and Jill. It sounds like they grew enormous. Like she talks about Jill moving into an apartment and planting fruit trees and a huge, huge garden. And I admire that. I mean, you're living in an apartment that you don't even own that you're not even going to keep, but you still invest, you know? And they were always canning. And she said Jill would just make any place she had. She was so into her. She said Jill would wake up inspired and just fix up all of her places. So cute. Nothing matched. It would have that wild country look, but she'd make everything super cute. So anyway, I read these things and it inspires me. And I don't know if we're gonna have some hard times. I mean, I just think that we're kind of living crazy. All these new cars and these expensive rents and expensive houses and, and you know, people's maxed out credit cards and student loans and loans and this and debt. And, and I think at some point, I mean, the bottom's gotta fall out and stuff's gotta happen. And I don't know how it's gonna affect each and every person. I really don't. But I feel motivated to become super, like really dive deep into my frugality and my homemaking. That's all, I just have this intuition and I listen. I have strong intuition I've always had strong intuition and I've listened to it and it's gotten me this far and it's created a wonderful life for my family. So right now I do not feel worried or scared or nervous or like, Oh, bad things are going to happen. I don't feel any of that, but I do feel this inner intuition that it's time to get deep into the homemaking, deep into the frugality deep into learning how to just be like really good with the money and live a really quiet, humble life. And I'm enjoying it. It's a hobby. It's a game. I'm having a good time with it. So anyway, it is now after six. So I'm going to fill my hummingbird feeder. I'm going to wash it out and fill it because it's bone dry now. They drank it up like quick. And I'm gonna go out and start watering my garden and then water my front yard, maybe give my cherry trees a little more water. And then I'm gonna take Molly for a W-A-L-K. And then I'm gonna sit down and do some writing. And that's, that's another thing. I do my watering and the walking with Molly in the evening or at night, like literally seven to 8.30 is garden watering and walking. And then the mornings is coffee and writing and then exercising and chores. It's working out perfect. I love my schedule. Anyway, we will continue this on. Um, I don't wanna go to, I, I don't wanna drive out of town again for a long time. Uh, I'm traumatized after driving today and I don't want to go to Winco for a long time. So uh, I'm going to work from the grocery outlet here and I'm going to continue to build up my pantry, but um, I don't need like rice or anything. So I'm going to continue to build it up and we'll work together on that. Bye.